Coming up next, we go behind the signature song off of a groundbreaking album that, get this, boasted 11 top 40 singles on the Hot 100. Seven of them went to number one. Unbelievable. It was so big, this album, you really have to call it a movement. The song most associated with this movement, it's been misunderstood for decades. Everybody knows it as a carefree jolt of swagger, but it's actually a very serious song from a group that dominated the charts, even doing something the Beatles didn't do. The lead singer replaced himself at number one, not once, not twice, but three times. Four straight number one hits, starting with this main song that began the momentum and it almost didn't get released. Find out about this coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if your cassette tape ever got jammed inside your car player and you couldn't get it out forever, so you had to listen to that album nonstop for a time, you're going to relate to this channel of musical nostalgia. We curate the best of the rock and roll era through interviews, stories, through history. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Check the box so that you always know what's coming out. We also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out there. You'll find uh, more videos. It helps us keep it a daily channel and to do more interviews and videos. So what album got jammed in your cassette tape? That happened to me a couple of times. You got to share below because I know it's happened to other people. It can't just be me. So in 1977, the Bee Gees comprised the twin brothers Robin and Morris Gibb. And of course, big brother Barry. They were in Paris working on material for their next album. While they were there, they received a call from their manager and entertainment mogul, Robert Stigwood. He was putting together a new movie and he wanted the brothers to write some songs for the soundtrack. Now, at this point, the film was still untitled and there wasn't much to tell him about it, only that it was gonna be about the disco craze. Uh, that film would, of course, become the famed Saturday Night Fever, one of the biggest movies of all time, one of the biggest soundtrack albums of all time. Saturday Night Fever. According to Robin, the three brothers had no concept of the movie during the writing process. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the only exception is they had a very rough draft of the script. He went on to say, we didn't really want to take our chances on a film, but we had a bunch of songs written and, you know, said that the movie executives were quite welcome to come and have a listen. When the Paramount reps arrived in France to hear what the Bee Gees had written, they were predictably underwhelmed. I say that because this is a familiar story in the music industry. I've had some people comment about it, about there's a lot of things that happen like this. Well, it happens a lot. Record executives, in this case, movie executives, who are completely clueless about what they're listening to. I mean, if it doesn't sound like anything that's already popular on the radio or in the theaters, they want nothing to do with it. Well, as it turns out, the batch of songs they were listening to, including three iconic disco era tracks, it would all go to number one of the Billboard Hot 100. How Deep Is Your Love? How Deep Is Your Love? Deep is your love? How deep is your Night Fever. And today's featured track, The Great Stayin' Alive. So as the story goes, Robert Stigwood got the idea for the movie from an article in New York Magazine called Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night, which was about the Brooklyn club scene. Uh, originally, the piece was published as a factual account. However, its author, Nick Kahn, uh, later revealed that it was a work of fiction based on his observations of disco culture at that time. Either way, Robert Stigwood was intrigued, and the end result was one of the most iconic films of the late 70s. Released on December 14th of 1977, Saturday Night Fever stars John Travolta as a 19-year-old Brooklyn native, Tony Manero. Tony, who you know, lives at home with his overbearing parents, spends his weekdays working uh, really a dead-end job at a paint store with no prospects for the future. I mean, the only thing that he has going for him, or really to look forward to, are Saturday nights at a local club called the 2001 Odyssey. There he's the king of the dance floor. You know, girl Swoon and his friends give him some respect. So at the 2001, Tony meets Stephanie, a dancer who is equally as gifted as he is. 
And the two agree to partner in a competition. And, you know, all throughout the film, Tony tries to, of course, win her affections, only to be repeatedly rebuffed. Stephanie dreams of a life outside of Brooklyn. And Tony represents everything she wants to, you know, leave behind. Yeah, you know, if you haven't seen it, I, I don't want to spoil the rest, but I'll say that this movie, a vital pop culture entry from the late 70s and an indisputable part of its legacy, probably the most important part of its legacy is its larger than life soundtrack, which you're probably already well aware. Saturday Night Fever is one of the biggest selling soundtracks of all time, one of the biggest albums of all time. At the time of its release, it was the biggest, and today it's sold over 16 million copies just in the US, and then 40 million copies worldwide. However, it would later be surpassed by 1992's The Bodyguard that uh, sold uh, reportedly 45 million copies globally. We'll always love you. Six songs performed by the Bee Gees made it onto the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. I mean, it's almost like a studio album for the Brothers Gibb, really. I've already mentioned uh, the three number one hits. Here's the rest of them. There was one more new cut, More Than a Woman. And uh, two old favorites, Jive Talking. And You Should Be Dancing. But the Bee Gees contributions uh, to this soundtrack didn't end just there. They also penned the Yvonne Elliman performed If I Can't Have You. If I can't have you, I don't want nobody. And then add to that the Tavares cover of More Than a Woman. And eight out of the 17 tracks are directly tied to the Bee Gees. And the primary reason the buying public went so crazy for the album, really. Others that contribute to the album are uh, artists like uh, Cool and the Gang. Casey and the Sunshine Band. MFSB. Walter Murphy. The Tramps. Now, as we further break down this classic song, I do have to mention our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, for good reason. The good news is Zenny has added new lenses to help you fight fatigue and eye strain from staring at our screens all the time. Zenny Blocks Plus and Blocks Plus Fatigue, uh, they give you 12 times more protection from digital blue light. And you get them for up to 80% off regular retail prices. Just click the info button up here to get the best deal. Design your own today. So get this, this only happened a few times in the history of pop music. The Saturday Night Fever soundtrack topped the US charts for an amazing, an astounding 24 weeks. It went to number one for 18 weeks in the UK. Uh, the hits kept on coming. How Deep Is Your Love, the first single in September of 77. That reached number one on Christmas Eve. That held the position for three weeks and it set a new Hot 100 record by staying in the top 10 for 17 consecutive weeks. Other charting Bee Gees compositions included Night Fever. If I Can't Have You. More Than a Woman, and of course, Stayin' Alive. Speaking of Stayin' Alive, so I guess originally Robert Stigwood wanted the Bee Gees to give Stayin' Alive a different title, a different name. He wanted it to be called just Saturday Night, Saturday Night, you know, so that it would match up better to, to the movie. However, the Gibbs brothers, they wanted nothing to do with that title. It wasn't very original, and it had already been used repeatedly in recent memory. As Morris explained, there were so many songs called Saturday Night, even one by the Bay City Rollers. So when we rewrote it for the movie, we called it Staying Alive. 
Stigwood objected when he heard that they were going to call the song Staying Alive, but the brothers told him that if he didn't like it, you know, they'd just use it on their next album they, instead of the soundtrack. And that was that, really. Thematically, Staying Alive is about a lot more than just dancing. Because it's so tied to Saturday Night Fever, the laid back good times of disco and carefree living, the swagger, many people don't realize it's a very dramatic song. Robin and Barry have both talked about the song's serious subject matter multiple times. They've explained it's about trying to survive in the big city. Lyrically, Stand Alive brings together two competing themes, bravado and struggle for survival. But actually, they work together almost effortlessly. Kicking the song off, we get some serious swagger from Barry who sings, well, you can tell by the way I use my walk, I'm a woman's man, no time to talk. These are lines uh, that forever link the image to John Travolta walking down that Brooklyn sidewalk. You know, his shoes hitting the concrete to the beat of the song. It's just perfect. It's one of the most iconic moments in cinematic history. Even people that don't like Saturday Night Fever have to admit, it's pretty damn good. But Barry's falsetto is just as brash as Travolta's strut. He's telling us all up front that he is the man, and he knows it. And his message throughout the song is clear. If you want to survive in the big city, you got to be tough. But you know what? Staying Alive also portrays his protagonist as someone struggling through repeated hardships. You catch that vision from lines like, I've been kicked around since I was born. And... Uh, Feel the city breaking and everybody's shaking. When the song breaks down with the lines, life going nowhere, somebody help me, somebody help me, yeah. Help me. I mean, you can really feel the desperation and the despair. Kind of changes the song when you really put it under a microscope. Barry Gibb fittingly called the song a cry for help. He said, everybody struggles against the world, fighting all the crap and things that drag you down. And it really is a victory just to survive. But when you climb back on top and win bigger than ever before, well, that's something that everybody reacts to. End of quote. I love that. This song is so much deeper than just the swagger and the good time feel. And actually, Staying Alive, it also had an accompanying music video, which wasn't always a given before MTV. I mean, you'd have performance videos, but this one is an actual music video. Directed by Bruce Gowers, the Stayin' Alive video showcases a very different visual aesthetic from Saturday Night Fever. Though thematically, yeah, the video still fits with the song pretty nicely. Filmed on the set of MGM Studios, the video shows the brothers walking and singing their way through an abandoned train station and a collection of derelict buildings. You know, with Barry's jacket slung over his shoulder and all three Bee Gees strutting with confidence, with a, a great swagger. You get the sense that maybe they could have given John Travolta a run for his money. I'm pretty dang good. Even on the dance floor. At least on the sidewalks, for sure. Originally, Staying Alive was not planned to be released as a single. I know we hear that a lot, but it, it's true. However, when audiences saw the trailer for Saturday Night Fever, and it features Staying Alive, they bombarded radio stations, and even the RSO Records main office got requests for the track like crazy. Not surprisingly, RSO released it shortly after, and it shot up the chart, it went all the way to number one. It actually spent four weeks there in February 78. They also spent another six weeks at number two for a total of two and a half months in the top two spots. Internationally, Staying Alive also reached number four in the UK, Ireland, Norway, uh, number three in Sweden, number two in France, Germany, Switzerland, Finland, and Austria. And it went to number one in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. It's a worldwide smash. The Bee Gees also became one of a handful of acts in the rock era to own the number one and number two songs at the very same time. 
This happened when Staying Alive slipped to number two and Night Fever snagged number one. Love is Thicker Than Water by younger brother Andy Gibb and Yvonne Elements If I Can't Have You also hit number one. That made Barry Gibb the only person in the rock and roll era to write four songs that consecutively went to number one. Four number one hits in a row, replacing himself time and time and time again. Not even the Beatles have done that. Since its reign at the top of the charts, Staying Alive has become entrenched in all facets of pop culture. It's one of the most downloaded pop tunes ever. It currently boasts uh, more than two billion streams on Spotify and YouTube combined, one of the biggest out there. And of course, Staying Alive has also appeared in a very long list of movies and TV shows. I came across at least 100 plus placements in my research. Here's a small sample of where you might be able to find it. It's an airplane. It's in a night at the Roxbury. That 70s show, Madagascar, Everybody Hates Chris. The Simpsons, of course. Strut. The Bounty Hunter, the other guy, Sherlock. Do you mind if I get that? No, no, please. Glee. Grey's Anatomy, Lip Sync Battle, The Secret Life of Pets, Supernatural. And Ready Player One. Staying Alive has also been covered by a lengthy list of artists, including Ozzy Osbourne. You gotta hear his version. It's Weasel Zappa together. In Sync, Heather Nova. Bruce Springsteen, Robbie Krieger. Celine Dion, They Might Be Giants, Georgia Marauder, Toe the West Sprocket, Jeff Scott Soto, Coldplay. Meatloaf, even Billy Joel's done. I also got to throw on my personal favorite cover sung by Marty and Elaine, featured in the Vince Vaughn and John Favreau classic, Swingers. It's just hilarious. You can actually still see these guys play it in LA. I've seen them a couple times. And probably the coolest thing about this song, 30 years after its release, Staying Alive has added a very unique distinction to its legacy. In 2008, the University of Illinois College of Medicine discovered that the song's rhythm moves at an ideal pace to jumpstart a fell heart. Working in time to the song's beat, you get 103 CPR compressions per minute. The American Heart Association recommends 100 chest compressions per minute. So it's almost perfect. Incidentally, Queen's Another One Bites the Dust also has a, a very similar beat. However, going off titles alone, I'd say that Staying Alive has to be a better fit. So Staying Alive, it's actually saved lives, if you can imagine that. In 2009, the office highlighted this when a CPR instructor tried to teach the technique to the Dunder Mifflin staff. Okay, well, a good trick is to pump to the tune of Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. Do you know that song? Yes. However, it all starts going sideways and the group starts singing and dancing to the song instead, which is a given. It's all right, it's okay, you can look the other way. Because of Saturday Night Fever's massive success and how dominant the disco sound was in 77, the Bee Gees were unfairly labeled purely a disco act at the time, which is an absolute shame. Because this band is so much more than that. They've sung, written, produced, and worked in a diverse range of genres throughout their career. They can do anything. I just gotta get a message to you. Said Morris about the effect of Saturday Night Fever it became our albatross. Before the film, we were called the uh, Blue-Eyed Soul. But after that, we are the kings of disco. I mean, don't get me wrong, genre labels can be useful to a point. 
that can help us identify musical styles that really resonate with all of us. However, when taken to the extreme, genre labels become uh, barriers to discovery. I think that swearing off a song, an album, or a band because you, know, you don't like that kind of music or because of genre preferences, that's a real mistake. Sometimes listening to something new and different can really surprise you, if not move you, when you really put the songs under a microscope. I think we all know that disco has gotten a lot of hate for a long time. I've made jokes about it. I love disco, though, actually. I mean, I like rock and roll better. And as Barry Gibb would actually note, a lot of great records didn't get the recognition and the exposure that they deserved simply because they were labeled disco. Now, I hate disco duck. But that doesn't mean I hate disco. I would also add a lot of great bands like the Bee Gees have taken a lot of heat, you know, because they were successful during the height of the disco era. The Gibbs are simply one of the greatest groups of all time, greatest songwriters ever, easy. And I don't think the brothers Gibb were ever really comfortable with the distinction of being the kings of disco, who would? To them, really Saturday Night Fever is just one chapter in a storied career for them. Yeah, it was a rare commercial and pop culture feat that most musicians can only dream of but they wanted to be known for more than that. Now, post Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees never really slowed down. In 1978, the group produced the chart-topping title track for the movie Grease. And they starred as the leads in the ill-fated Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band movie, also 78. I'm getting high with a little help from my friend. In 1979, they continued their chart hot streak with the number one album, Spirits Having Flown. Three more singles would also reach number one. There was Tragedy. Love You Inside Out. And Too Much Heaven. That actually made it six number one hits in a row. Again, stuff that only the Beatles have done, or Elvis. From there, the Bee Gees increasingly put their focus into production and collaboration. The brothers wrote hits for, of course, Diana Ross, Kenny Rogers, and Dolly Parton. The street, that is what we are. No Barry Gibb co-produced Barbra Streisand's 1980 album, Guilty, and duetted with her on the uh, chart-topping title track. The Brothers Gibb also contributed to another movie soundtrack in 83, the Saturday Night Fever sequel, Staying Alive. But the fever still burns. <laughs> Staying Alive. The soundtrack included five new BG songs and a heavily edited version of Staying Alive. After some years out of the limelight, the Bee Gees released the album ESP in 1987. Their single, You Win Again, I mean, it stalled at number 75 in the US, but it went to number one in the UK, a welcome comeback. My parents had the album, I remember when they bought it and I listened to it. I loved it. Sadly, the death of younger brother Andy in 1988 added a tragic tone to the celebration. Actually, the title track for their next album, One, was dedicated to his memory. It actually reached number seven on the Hot 100. In the 90s, the Bee Gees continued to release more albums, including Sizes and Everything and Still Waters, which both reached number 11 on the US Albums Chart. Their final studio album, this is where I came in, it went to number 16 on the Albums Chart. Just where I came in. Oh, right. Forget disco band. These guys were one of the greatest bands, greatest groups ever. I mean, the Beatles, Elton John, Elvis Presley, Bee Gees, they're, they're in the same group, the same category. They've had as much success as anybody. And through musical changes, through decades, through fads, through it all, they have an innate ability, more than anybody, of staying alive. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about the Bee Gees and staying alive. What do you remember about this monumental track? Did you know that it was about survival as more of a serious song? What do you think about replacing himself at number one all those times? Let's have a great discussion. Where do the Bee Gees stand in terms of all time 
Let's talk about it below. If you like this content, we invite you to subscribe. Sorry, I'm, I'm just so excited. I love the BG so much. One of my dad's favorites that he passed on to me. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you.